There are two peptic ulcer diseases. We have duodenal and gastric ulcers. Good. So what happens is, uh, for various reasons, chapter 40. So there's now erosion of one or more portions of your gastric or duodenal mucosa. Now, keep in mind, let's review anatomy. Our GI tract is protected from our own gastric juices by the mucosal lining. This mucosal lining is produced by cells all over the GI tract from your mouth down to your rectum, which produces a constant thick layer of mucus. This will prevent your mucosa from being exposed and harmed by the acid. Okay. So as long as everything's intact, we're good. Okay. We will not have any ulcers. There will not be any exposed blood vessels. Therefore, no bleeding. Okay. We'll talk about complications later. Let's go straight to the causes. There are two major causes when I say two major, those are the most common. There are several other causes of duodenal, uh, I mean, uh, peptic ulcers as well. Look at the first statement. In the past, stress and anxiety were thought to be causes of peptic ulcers, but research shows that what's actually the cause? Number one cause is H. pylori. So this is Helicobacter pylori. That's a bacterial infection. We pick it up at some point during our lives. They stay dormant. They only cause trouble when we are older and when we have other factors that will decrease or weaken the, the mucosal lining, and then they will cause trouble. Now, for a bacterium that can imagine the environment there, if you live in the stomach or in the small intestine, what would that environment be? Yeah, because we eat three at least three times a day, right? So therefore, there will be acid secretion at least three times a day. So is that a very uh, nice place to live in? No, not at all. Okay, not at all. So what can you say about this organism that can live there for decades? They're badass organisms, right? They're, they're not easy to kill. Okay, so keep that in mind when we go to treat to treatment now of H. pylori infection. Clear? All right. The other cause, major cause, are NSAIDs. Chronic use of NSAIDs. I'm not saying occasional one-time use of these drugs, meaning chronic use, like every day for several months, for several years. And the reasons are here. Uh, NSAIDs, just like H. pylori, impair the gastric mucosa. Now, NSAIDs do this by inhibiting prostaglandin. So that's how the drug works. It inhibits prostaglandin, which is a neurotransmitter for pain. Prostaglandin, however, is also responsible for vasodilation. So therefore, those cells that I mentioned earlier that produce the mucosal lining of the stomach, need blood vessels too, correct? So if you're constantly taking NSAIDs, which results in chronic vasoconstriction, they impair and deprive those cells, those mucus producing cells of blood flow, thereby killing them. And therefore less mucosal lining exposes the mucosa to the acid and we have peptic ulcers. Make sense? All right. Other costs are smoking and alcohol, but what are the two major? And H. pylori infection. Okay. Again, there are many others. Here's another rare condition, Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. That's another possible cause of peptic ulcers. And a few more are mentioned here. I already explained the 
pathophysiology that we have the protective mucosal barrier, but because of H. pylori, chronic NSAIDs used, they wear down that mucosal lining barrier and then exposing the mucosa to the acids, causing ulcerations, exposing the blood vessels, ultimately leading to GI bleeding and possibly perforation as well. So the thinner the mucosa becomes, then the more possibility of perforation, being your 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 you have a hole in your stomach or in your duodenum. And here's the stress ulcer, which is common in hospitalized patients, particularly those in the ICU. Manifestations. Now there's a big difference between gastric and duodenal ulcers. Now they differ specifically in the pain. When is the onset of the pain? Now let's review physiology. When we eat a meal, how long does the meal stay in the stomach? One, one to two hours. One to two hours later, it moves on to the duodenum. What's yeah. the food doing in the stomach for one to two hours? It's, uh, it's being converted to liquid. Okay, It's being liquefied after exposure to gastrin, pepsin, hydrochloric acid. That will melt almost anything, right? Except steel. So it will turn the food, the chicharron, whatever else you're eating into liquid. So now it's ready for the duodenum. We're in what's happening in the duodenum. Okay, the liquid form of food is now absorbed into the bloodstream. Then that's how nutrients are sent to the rest of the body. Okay. Now let's go to the manifestations. The pain. When is the pain felt in gastric ulcers? So if your ulcer, if your peptic ulcer is in the stomach, when is the pain felt? Immediately after eating. Why? Because acid production starts. And of course, you have a ulcer there. The pain will start right away. Why is the duodenal ulcer pain later? Okay, because the acid production didn't start until two to three hours after the meal. That's the time when the liquefied food now enters the duodenum. Okay. Here are other nonspecific symptoms that accompany them. We'll talk more about the bleeding shortly. And some Manifestations may be specific depending on the specific location of the ulcer. If it's in the antrum of the stomach or whether it's in the pyloric uh, section. Pyloric is referring to the, the sphincter, okay, the pylorus of the uh, of the GI tract. And here are other manifestations. Either constipation or diarrhea can occur. <clears throat> Diagnosis. How do we know if you have a peptic ulcer? How do we know? Endoscopy. Doctor has to put the scope down your throat into your esophagus, watch your esophagus, your stomach, and your small intestine. Every endoscopy, they will, once they see the ulcer, they will take a biopsy and send it for H. pylori workup to see whether or not there is H. pylori. Let's go now to the treatment. Treatment is based on what caused the peptic ulcer. If it's positive for H. pylori, what do you think would be the treatment? Antibiotics. Antibiotics. Now, the combination therapy is not mentioned here. It's under, actually it's here. Uh, but for the other drugs, we'll go to gastritis. It's an earlier section of the chapter 40 uh, because that's where they um, they're listed it. Because gastritis and peptic ulcer have the same treatment except for the antibiotics. So if you have H. pylori infection causing the peptic ulcer, you will be on this regimen. So one PPI or H2 receptor antagonist, you know the drugs, right? 
So these are H2 receptor blockers. They all end in tidine, whereas PPIs end in prazole. All of them are prazoles. Uh, just look at your textbooks are here. Look at your, your book. So you'll have the <clears throat> a table 40-3. Now, besides that, the patient will be on combination antibiotics. Why combination? Why not just one? Pneumonia is given it or or UTI is treated with one. Why multiple? This is a strong bacteria. Okay, as we okay. described earlier, something, yes, yeah, something this tough yeah. that can withstand that acidic environment. Is it easy or hard to kill? Hard. That's a pretty bad, uh, a bad boy uh, bacterium, right? So <laughs> we're going to have to kill it with several antibiotics. So it can be either triple or quadruple therapy. When we say triple, no pepto. Bismuth subsalicylate is peptobismol. So if it's triple therapy, it'll be two antibiotics and the PPI. Clear? Okay, so if it's three, it'll just be tetra and metro plus the PPI. That's it. It's quadruple. We'll add pepto. Clear? All right. If it's... If it's caused by chronic NSAIDs, can we tell the patient to stop taking the NSAIDs? Yes. What if they have rheumatoid arthritis? Nothing know. else works for rheumatoid arthritis. But only methotrexate, not for the pain. Methotrexate is not for pain. Doesn't work. Can't you get the Again, some people cannot take any other pain meds except NSAIDs. So for those people, what can be given oh. as a prophylactic for NSAIDs, uh, for, for peptic ulcer? What is, what misoprostol. Oh. Okay, so we will put them on misoprostol. Right? 100, correct. 100 to 200 micrograms four times a day. Of course, if you're pregnant or planning to be, you can't be on this drug. Clear? Are we clear? Okay. So yeah, this is the same drug you hear about on TV. This is this is the medication used for abortion. Okay, one of them. There's blah, whatever. Okay. So this one is the uh, older one. Okay. So here's the warning again. Pregnancy. Should not so be taken with the NSAIDs. No, yes, no. with the NSAIDs. <laughs> okay, let me explain. Let me explain why. Okay, here's the explanation. NSAIDs work how? How do they decrease pain? Inhibiting. There is some kind of animal. Inhibiting prostaglandin, right? Okay. Misoprostol is a prostaglandin agonist. agonist yeah. So if NSAIDs are prostaglandin antagonists, so basically they fight each other. No, it will. <laughs> well, they balance yeah. each other. Right. Are we clear? All right. So patients who have to take NSAIDs can continue, but they'll just have to take misoprostol with it, unless, of course, uh, there's pregnancy related issues. Okay. I think we'll learn this. We'll now, what's your question? I think we talked about it. Oh, okay. All right, so that's the therapy. So now we're not done. Uh, here's the uh, warning about misoprostol. So please uh, read it. Uh, I'll go back to gastritis first to look at the other drugs used for peptic ulcers, and then I'll continue with the rest of the management. Right here under gastritis section, under management. Here are the list of drugs used to treat peptic ulcer and gastritis as well. <clears throat> so there'll be about four groups here. We already talked about the antibiotic therapy. So these are the different combinations. You can do amoxicillin and erythromycin or tetracycline and metronidazole. Doctor decides though. 
here's the if you have quadruple therapy as mentioned so you will take this um pepto and you are again the thimetidine now you notice under the peptic ulcer the nursing implications wasn't mentioned anymore correct <clears throat> there were no nursing implications under the table under peptic oh. ulcer because it's here so the tab table 40-2 contains the nursing considerations. Okay. All right. So refer to this because the questions will be on nursing okay. implications. Okay. Because it's always about what are your responsibilities? What do you teach the patient? What do you monitor the patient for side effect wise? Any questions? Nope. Okay. So let's uh, review the others. So we know how do cimetidine, how do receptor, H2 receptor antagonists differ from PPI? What's the main difference between the two? It, it decreases the one H2 what, receptor blockers. What the will provide the shed the layer of the protection. Actually, they both do the same thing yes, it's in different ways. Okay. So H2 receptor antagonist just blocks the histamine receptors. That's how they decrease acid production. <clears throat> proton pump inhibitors do what? Inhibit the proton pump receptors. Okay. But both of them do the same thing. They decrease acid secretion, right? Yeah. Main difference is the duration. H2 receptor blockers last only about 12 hours. That's why how often are they administered? Twice a day. PPIs, how often are they administered? Once because they last for 24 hours. Clear? So for off the record, no, for the life of me, I don't know why H2 receptor antagonists are still around. Because PPIs pretty much do this the same thing more efficiently. One pill versus two. Make sense? Yeah. So look at the the business though. We have uh we have uh Pepsid, we have Zantac, right? Different brands, right? All done by the same pro uh, Protonix, um Nexium, what else? Um, Prilosec. Okay, those are PPIs, which are more efficient because one pill a day, one capsule a day versus two. And here's misoprostol, and here are more complete nursing implications. It was very short under peptic ulcers. And here's the one. So, Christopher, you mentioned the coating agent. Uh -huh. Okay, so this, you're referring to sucralfate. So, the, the purpose of taking this is it will do what? Forms a protective barrier. It's a liquid, right? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a tablet, but it quickly disintegrates. If you take it, it, it crumbles immediately. Try putting it in water, it will immediately <laughs> um, disintegrate. Anyway, so this will form a protective barrier on the ulcer. Therefore, is the ulcer still exposed to the acid? No, because you have a protective barrier. So knowing that, how often and when should you take this? Very good. So here, one hour before meals. And do we have acid secretion also at bedtime? We do. Yeah. Okay, so therefore, um, one hour before meals and also one at bedtime. Okay, so you expect on your MAR, patients with peptic ulcers, this is what you're going to be expecting. Okay, if the patient is on is NPO, let's say they're taking, you're on a peg tube feeding, you know, enteron feeding, it will change the time. It'll be like every six hours. But if the patient's eating like you and me, it'll be one hour before meals and one at bedtime. Right? <clears throat> and just like antacids, antacids aren't listed here. I don't know why, because peptic ulcers also take antacids. Um But it, it's part of the therapy. Okay? Uh, peptic ulcer patients are prescribed antacids as well. Never take any other drug within two hours of taking sucralfate, just like antacids. Why? 
it won't work because they will, yeah, there will be no absorption for those other drugs. Clear? All right. So the same thing, antacids and sucrophate, they should be given separately, okay, on their own. Do not give drugs uh, one or two hours within administration, before and after administration of, of uh, sucrophate or any antacids. All right. Well, back to peptic ulcers. So for how long? Now, during the acute episode, here is the uh, teachings. Uh, NSAIDs will have to be avoided for how long? <clears throat> okay, during the acute episode for at least a week, okay? Uh, symptoms disappear, then you can resume, but now you have to take it with what? Mesoprostol, okay? All right, we looked at these drugs already on table 40-2. All right, let's continue with the other management. Stop smoking. There's really no benefit to smoking. What about, what about alcohol? Yeah. Um, Stop alcohol? Yeah. Moderation. Okay, moderation. Uh, and then you have to drink alcohol with what? <laughs> <laughs> That's called Long Island iced tea okay? <laughs> or a club soda. <clears throat> now, you drink, it, uh, drink only with meals, right? That way your alcohol um, taken on an empty stomach, of course, is harmful to the ulcer. Dietary mod modification. Look at this. Is there really uh, a role of um, nutrition therapy to, to treat I think so. Also, like uh, let's 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 read the evidence. So, so what what does it say here? Yeah, people don't follow you. So, is there really uh, evidence that the kind of food you eat will treat ulcer, yeah, or yeah. just Not exactly. Exactly. Oh, okay? Very good. Okay. So that's the idea here. So there's really no like eat this and that's good for ulcer. No. Yeah. Um, so here, so we avoid certain things. So what would be uh, suggestions? Okay, minimize by avoiding too cold. Yeah, not your food or beverage must not be too hot or too cold. Okay. So here, alcohol, coffee. Yeah other caffeinated beverages so basically caffeine okay avoid it the manner or the habit eating habit would be three small meals oh no sorry uh, yeah that's regular meals versus small frequent okay because small frequent will just stimulate more acids right so therefore three regular meals versus um over uh, frequent because okay? frequent that means there would be also longer and more frequent uh, acid production or basically this is the be best rule don't eat anything that will cause symptoms okay? if the taco causes your symptoms then don't, don't eat, eat the taco, taco right learn your body. so it's all trial and error hey, no matter how much you love something I will not test any surgical options, so we'll skip the surgery. Let's go now to complications. Um, oh, symptom management, uh, pain relief. You know, the avoiding the food, how you eat, or the eating pattern. Uh, stay with your treatment. Okay, the what are those treatments again? H2 receptor blockers, PPIs, or antibiotic if you have H. pylori, mixoprostol if you have, uh, if you have to take NSAIDs. Okay, and then the antacids and the sucrophate. And then reducing anxiety. Uh, of course, besides teaching, the more you know, then the the better 
you get a handle of your anxiety, you know, you because you know what's gonna happen. Let's go to complications. As far as complications, as with anything else, you what what do we what two things do we need to know about complications? How to recognize it and what to do. Okay. All right. Bleeding is the most life threatening complication of peptic ulcers. So this is going to happen once you have exposed blood vessels and then those blood vessels, arteries and veins will be exposed to the acid. Of course, they will be eroded and then start bleeding. So recognizing it will be, okay. So obviously if you see blood coming out of, you know, you vomit or you poop stool, uh, poop blood, then that's obvious. But hidden blood will be black or tarry. And then you gave me the vital signs changes earlier, right here. So these are the vital signs. And then let's go to management. So what will be done if the patient is admitted for GI bleed? It doesn't really make a difference whether the GI bleed is caused by a peptic, peptic ulcer or something else. <laughs> management is really the same. First is, <coughs> what's the first intervention? Blood right away? Is blood available right away? Uh, what will be given? Fluid. fluid. Because remember, we're trying to prevent hypovolemic shock, right? So fluids first, and then as soon as the blood is available, we administer. How can we stop or, or um, minimize the bleeding? Slow it down. What will be done? Surgery? Well, surgery will be done to stop the surgery, but uh, we... To stop the bleeding. <laughs> so what will be done in order to decrease or slow down the bleeding? Because what's causing the bleeding? Fermentation. You have an ulcer exposing the blood vessels, mm -hmm. exposing them to what? Acid. Acid. So therefore, how can you slow down or even stop the bleeding? Give, okay, give the PPIs or the H receptor blockers. Typically... No, you already have uh, acute bleeding. So in that case, since they're acutely bleeding from yeah. the ulcer, would a once a day PPI no, or twice a day? Okay, it will be a continuous IV infusion. Are we clear? Yes. You So you anticipate that peptic ulcer bleeding or any GI bleeding, what do you expect to be given? IV uh, PPI yeah. in a drip. Okay. Patient may also receive antibiotics because can that also be in infected? Yes. Okay, so expect maybe a GI antibiotic like metronidazole, okay, a flagyl. So you'll be giving that every six hours until the patient's stable enough to go to surgery. So either they'll get a endoscopy or let's say a CAT scan shows or an MRI shows, oh, there's a hole. We have to open the patient up, okay? And then... Depends. If the section is small, we can cut it and then re-anastomose, just stitch the remaining parts back. Or if it's a significant loss of bowel, then we'll have to end up with an ostomy, right? Because we can't join them back anymore. You lost a big chunk of the bowel. So now you'll end up with a ostomy. Uh, another thing I did mention, uh, besides fluids, uh, blood component, and the PPI infusion will be NG. Okay. This NG is not for feeding. Okay, this will be to yeah, decompress. Yeah, decompress the stomach because peristalsis will stop here. Patient will have there's injury to the stomach or the duodenum. There will be no peristalsis. So you put an NG tube. This will suck out all the blood, all the acid. Plus, prevent the patient from aspirating because there will be severe nausea vomiting here. Because once peristalsis stops, patient will be miserable. They'll be vomiting uh, violently. Perforation, same thing, same questions. I'll ask you, how do you know that there's perforation or penetration? So find the manifestations. Uh, this typically goes to... to 
um, we'll, we'll get to the peritonitis next. So these are signs and symptoms of possible perforation, meaning there's a hole in your stomach. So now is poop, fecal matter, yeah. food now in the peritoneum? Mm -hmm. Is the peritoneum sterile? No. Wait a minute. No. The peritoneum. Yes, it is. That is sterile. The GI tract is not, but the peritoneum is sterile. So if you put poop, it's a serious infection. Okay, so that will cause cause sepsis, right? So here are your manifestations. Clear? Yeah. So the only thing we can do there is what? Can the nurses do anything? Oh no. Call the doctor. Prepare the patient for surgery. Uh, obstructions. So same thing. Just focus on the manifestations and then interventions. Okay. So those are the major complications. What are they? Hemorrhage, mm -hmm. perforation or penetration, and peritonitis. Yeah, peritonitis. Oh, uh, lastly, pep gastric output obstruction. Let me make sure first. Yes, we are done.